is Francis Westbrook at the Atlanta History Center. Our veteran is Denver Gray. Mr. Gray, please tell us your name, spell your name, give us your birth date, place of birth, and your current address. My name is Denver Gray, D-E-N-V-E-R-G-R-A-Y. Uh, I was born in Palmyra, Nebraska. I presently live in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you. Now, Mr. Gray, when did you enter the service? I entered the service in August the 5th, 1941, at Fort Omaha, Nebraska. And please just begin today by telling us uh, about your military service. Begin where you would like to begin. When I graduated from the University of Nebraska, I went to work with the Travelers Insurance Company in Omaha, Nebraska. They, uh, Travelers had a large office with many desks of agents that worked out of the office. One of the agents was Johnny Rosenswag. Rosenswag, uh, father had been a very successful agent, so he inherited, he didn't have to work too hard, his main interest was military. We had the seventh core area in Omaha that covered from the Dakotas down to Oklahoma. He was called to active duty. And on, uh, he called me out in July to the embassy lounge. We sat down, ordered a drink, and he said, Gray, you're going to be called. Well, that didn't surprise me because Hitler was running in Europe and uh, I, the class of 1941 ROTC immediately went into service. I was then the 40 class was called two weeks later so it was obvious we were going to be called. But the next question he asked, said, Gray, where do you want to go? Well, that completely threw me because I never in the last uh, fondest dream thought anybody would ever ask me where I wanted to go. My orbit at that time was I'd been to Chicago, I'd been to Denver, I'd been to Minneapolis, and I'd been to Oklahoma City. That was the orbit that I had and I thought, well, supposedly we were going to be called for one year. And I thought for one year, I'd like to see the ocean and see something overseas. So I said, how about uh, the Philippines? Oh, he said, blank, no, you don't want to go to the Philippines. That's 20 days on a boat. Well, I thought 20 days. Gosh, that is a long time. I said, well, how about Alaska? He said, oh, no, you don't want to go to Alaska. You freeze, you know what, up there. So I thought a little more, and I said, how about Hawaii? He said, that's it. So the weather's good. It's five days on the boat. The next thing comes in, I'll put you on. It wasn't two weeks until I get orders from the War Department with the letter uh, calling me to active duty. With, to report to Fort Omaha for duty in the Hawaiian Department. I report to Fort Omaha. We take our physicals, and there must have been almost a city block of us in our birthday suits waiting for shots. And the guy ahead would say he's going to Fort Hood. Another one was going to Fort Leonard Wood, and all places that didn't sound too exciting. I didn't say anything. Finally, well, somebody said, well, Gray, where in the blank are you going? I said, well, I'm going to Hawaii. Well, I got a lot of uh, unsavory remarks from that. And I said, well, I am worried about getting sunburned. I called, I reported to Fort, uh, to, uh, Fort Mason and uh, my best friend in college, uh, Lauren Biggs, had been, uh, went through an app midshipman school in Chicago, and he was stationed at Treasure Island. I called Lauren, and I told him I was there, and he said, well, I'll come right over. I was at the Canterbury Hotel. And Lauren, when he got there, he said, would you like to, uh, oh, in the 
before Lauren got there, I got a call, and they said, Lieutenant Gray, and I said, yes. They said, you're assigned to leave the next day and gave me the name of the ship. Well, I was surprised because I thought I'd be on a layover in, in San Francisco for several days. I called Lorne and I told him that I was going to be leaving. He said, well, I'll be right over. He came over and he said, would you like to see the ship you're going to go on? Well, I said, yes, I would. So we got a taxi and went down to Fort Mason. And when a ship is tied up at a pier, the, the MPs are in charge of the pier, and then there's an officer deck which is in charge of the ship. And you have to get approval of both before you can board a ship. The MP, we looked up, and Biggs recognized Ensign Bishop. Bishop had been with him, and Bishop was from Seattle. And Bishop called down and said, to Big said, do you want to show Gray the ship he's going out on? And Big said, yes. Well, the Navy, the Army said I couldn't go up because they were in the pier. Well, there was a back and forth, and finally I got aboard. Uh, he showed me around, and Big said, we're going to do the town tonight. Would you like to join us? And, and Bishop said, yes. Well. We did, and I got to know Bishop. So the next day, I report to the ship with all my gear, and I'm assigned a place back over the rudder and a, down in a hole where there was four of us, and we had bunks that you folded up during the day and then put down at night, and you had to get in one at a time because you couldn't all get in there at once and get in. the. So it was a mess, and one of the four of us was a football player from Texas A&M. We were trying to figure out how on the deuce we were all four going to get in there and get to sleep when a sailor came up and said, Lieutenant Gray, said, get your gear and come with me. I did. Well, I end up in the stateroom, the top, the best facility they had on the ship. There was a major in there. He'd never been on a ship before, and he didn't know why a second lieutenant was going to join in him to sleep, but he never asked me, and I never asked him. As a result, Bishop was on eight hours and off eight hours. For five days, I followed his schedule. When he was on duty, I was with him, and then when he wasn't, would try to sleep. Well, Bishop had a very fine voice. He sang in the opera in Seattle. And uh, he told me about all of his romances. Well, in five days, eight on and eight out, you get to hear a lot of romances, which I did, but I didn't have anything else to do. I walked down the gangplank in Aloha Tower, Honolulu, uh, on uh, October 17th, five days. October the 20th something. And when I went down the gangplank, it was in Honolulu at Loa Tower, and the first thing that struck me was the high humidity. I broke out in perspiring. In fact, I wet the back of my shirt, which is the high humidity, which was noticeable. And the greenery, everything was so green. Go down the gangplank and get down, and gosh, there's a pretty little girl there, Hawaiian girl. She gave me a little smudge and put a flower lay around my neck. And the Air Force, uh, before the war, the pilots that, grew, that graduated from uh, uh, the field in Texas that trained all of the pilots, uh, they got their wings and they immediately walked across the street if they were signed overseas and signed up for a convertible because the service would ship their car overseas. It was worth more overseas than it was here in the States. They got life insurance on the pilot so if he didn't live. So it was a win-win-win for the auto dealers. So every Air Force pilot had a convertible. 
Well, they were anxious to get more people. They were short of people. So they had a lineup of convertibles, and each one of us was put in a convertible in the back seat, and we rode in a file, must have been a quarter of a mile of us, out to Hickam Field. And Hickam Field is about 10 to 15 miles from west of Honolulu. We enter Hickam Field, and the main Main Street in Hickam Field is Signer Boulevard, and it is a beautiful place. Signer Boulevard uh, was the islands in the street were all with bougainvillea and hibiscus and green and well manicured. The buildings were all yellow stucco with red uh, barrel tile roofs. It was beautiful. We went down and they took us to the officers club, which is at the end of Signer Boulevard, and it overlooks the entrance of Pearl Harbor. We went out on the patio and you could see ships just a block away going in and out. And they gave us a form to fill out for they, them trying to figure out how they would assign us. I put down, I'd graduated from University of Nebraska, a College of Agriculture. Well, I went before Colonel Boyd and Colonel Shea. They were either lieutenant colonels or four colonels at that time. Shea later distinguished himself. He was an excellent athlete at West Point, and he was a the state uh, golf champion at Iowa a great athlete, and his wife was quite famous. She wrote Army Wife and Navy Wife, Nancy Shea, and I'm sure it's in all of the libraries. Well, I went before Shea and Boyd, and when they said that I was graduate from agriculture, they were trying to think, and they said, well, Heckam Field, there was Bellows Field and Wheeler Field and why, uh, and why and I, and uh, then there was fields on the other islands of Kauai and Maui and the big island of Hawaii. And uh, Shea said, well, Heckam Field is the only field that has a nursery. And since you've got agriculture, we'll sign you to Heckam. Well, later when they had us all out, they started to named the places and one of my buddies went to Wheeler and another one to Bellows and got to my name and it was Hickam. And they looked at me and said, what'd you do to get, how'd you get to Hickam? Well, I said, I don't know. So I, I end up Hickam and Boyd and Shea, when they were interviewed me, they said, well, Gray, what did you do in sports? Well, I was no star athlete. I said, well, I, lettered in basketball in high school, and I played intramural basketball at college. They said, great, we're going to sign you to the headquarters squadron of 17th Air Base Group, and you're going to be the group uh, basketball coach. Well, before the war, Hawaii is a beautiful place, but it has the same temperature the year round, and it gets very monotonous and there was, I think, 4,000 men for every girl on the island, so the social life and the morale was a very big problem. So the services had unlimited money for sports. And as basketball coach, I could get people out of the guardhouse. I could get anybody I wanted off duty to play basketball. Well, we'd had, they just finished a tournament of squadrons, and we were then picking a group basketball t team that would play for the island championship. I had the pick of four or five teams. So I picked a tall team of 6'2 and over, and that's tall. At that time, 6'2 was very tall. And I picked a short team. The short team, we played man-to-man -man and went 
all out as fast as we could. We, when they came off the field, the other team was really blowing air. Then I'd put in the long, tall team, which would go slow uh, on a zone defense and work in. We played, uh, we played the champion team off the Indianapolis uh, cruiser that had been the champion basketball team of the Philippines. We played them and won. We went up to Schofield and played a re regimental team and won. We flew to Hilo and played the uh, Hawaiian National Guard team and won. The war came. My star uh, forward, uh, Williams, lost his right wrist. Uh, another one got shrapnel in his lungs. Another one was hit in his leg. So we, we played no more basketball after. December 7th. Um, I, uh, I, the, uh, the, the big thing in peacetime is social and athletics. And the military makes a big thing of social life because they have so much time on their hands. Heckam Field was a beautiful club. It was all Philippine mahogany, uh, outdoor patio with the terrazzo floor, and the dance band would be the out, and we'd dance out under the stars. You couldn't go to the officers' club after seven o'clock without dress whites, white military or white tuxedo coat. <clears throat> None of us that had gotten off the boat had either. And you had to order them from the mainland. So we immediately, uh, Lieutenant Smart, who was in our squadron, he was from North Dakota, he was a North Dakota uh, All-American fullback and he was a heavyweight boxing champion for North Dakota. He was in our squadron and we lived next to each other in a BOQ, or Bachelor's Officer's Quarter. Uh, we ordered our coats, and on December the 6th, we got notice from the hub that our coats were in. We went down and got our coats, rented a car, got dates, and went to the dance at the Hickam Officers Club December 6th, 1941. Uh, time we got, took the girls home and took the car and got home, I went to bed about uh, 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I sleep pretty sound, but uh, I don't know whether it was the explosion, the concussion, or the rattling. We had screen on our barracks. Uh, my room was just barely big enough for a cot, and I had one screened window with no glass, but the dust blew in on my bed, so I'd gone to Sears and got a wicker roll down to keep the dust off of my bed. Well, it was down halfway or so, but it, I think, flew out over my bed, and I got up, looked out, and the top of the Hawaiian depot was going up in the air and the jet, uh, plane was going skyward with a big red circle on it. So I knew immediately we were under attack. The officers on the other side of the barracks couldn't see and they thought the Navy, the Navy was always practicing on Sundays and all and we blamed everything on the Navy and they blamed everything on us. But uh, they said, no hell, it's the Navy. And I said, no, we're under attack. Most of our people in the barracks were pilots. Pilots don't have a desk. Smart and I had desk. He was the base photo officer, and I was a uh, supply officer for the headquarters squadron. And But my main duty was that basketball coach. But So 
Smart and I said, we've got to get with our units. So we, we dressed and took off. Pilots mulled around. One of my friends had a new Studebaker and he didn't, he didn't have any desk or anywhere to go. So he got in his car and he'd remembered that uh, a bomb never hits the same place. So he f found the biggest bomb crater and parked his car next to it to try to save his car. Another two friends from Texas, they were navigators and they were cadets. They sent, they sent cadets over in their uniforms and they had their advanced training on the job and then they got their commissions. They had a blue uniform and a different hat and a different wings on their hat. Well, Halfley, they both came later and they were out on the, the baseball field coming across. They looked up and bombs were coming straight for them. They dropped down, the explosion went up over them and around a bomb crater there's a, a area where there's no debris, it goes up over. They were in that area. One of them got some, uh, some coral on his shoulder and had his arm in the sling for a week or two. But the other one lost his hat and he couldn't find the hat. And he'd promised that wings on his hat for his girlfriend and he never did find it. Uh, Smart, when we said we had to get to a unit, we dressed. We took off. We had about a block and a half to go down to Hangar Boulevard, which ran parallel to the hangars in the plane. As we turned the corner on Hangar Boulevard, there was a B-24 on burning. Everything was secret. Nobody told anything of where, where planes, where they were going or anything. And this B-24 was burning, and out of the burning came a human skull. It was the first casualty. Uh, I found out later that that plane was a B-24, and it was destined to go to Guam to photograph uh, the islands to see what the Japanese had, which we didn't know what. And the, of course, the crew was all killed and never got off. Uh, as Smart and I walked down Hangar Boulevard, uh, some of the dive bombers, the bombs missed and hit the street. Uh, I think if you hit a bomb hit the street outside of this building, you'd probably hit a water main. And it had hit water main and water was just gushing up out of the hole in the street. We went on down and uh, to the right was underground uh, aviation tanks for all of the aviation fuel. And they had uh, gizmos where they loaded into the tank and a sort of, sort of something on the cover, but those nozzles were burning. Well, we knew, we, com we commented that this damn thing might blow up. Well, I found out later that it wouldn't. It worked as a wick, but we had millions of gallons of high octane gas under that. We went on down. Smart got off at the photo lab where he was a photo officer. I went on to the barracks wing C where headquarters squadron or orderly room three stories high and it was well built reinforced concrete the ceiling on the third floor and each floor was reinforced concrete uh, it turned out it was probably one of the safest places that we'd be except the planes came from the southwest going northwest and they came at an angle and some of the bombs hit the side of the building and blew so it wasn't 
all entirely safe being under that in the building. Um, I got a reported to the orderly room, and I had in the supply of four or five or six soldiers, and uh, uh, one of them was Melnick, William Melnick. The soldiers, uh, we had a lot of people from uh, Pennsylvania and Arkansas uh, come from very poor families. They were, Melnick was Polish, and there were four, five of his uh, uh, friends, all Polish, that grew up on the same street in Pennsylvania, listed the same time, and they're all in my unit. I had Melnick, was it one of them, very bright, and I'm very proud of him. He later went on and got his doctor's degree, and he, General Motors, and he designed the uh, copper uh, re uh, radiator, or aluminum radiator, so done very well. So I was very proud of Melnick, but uh, we, we issued in the supply room, we had some World War I helmets, we had some gas masks, we had some 45 pistols. We issued uh, anything we had, anybody wanted, we issued. Um, my squadron commander was Howard Cooper. He was first lieutenant and he was a University of Hawaii graduate. He uh, was a CO. I didn't know it at the time because the orderly room was next to the supply and I didn't stop in the orderly room. It learned out later Cooper got hit with shrapnel and never made it to the office. He was on crutches but he came back. The second in command was uh, Malcolm Brumwell. Uh, Brumwell was a University of Kansas graduate uh, and a professor in biology. He was from North Dakota. He too had seen the water main craters in the water and he was concerned about us having water to drink. So he came in the orderly room with two airmen and wanted a container to go get water. We issued him a big aluminum container and they left. It was only a short time that the two carried him back. He'd been mortally wounded with shrapnel. We we tried to put him at ease on the counter, and everything went black. You couldn't see a thing. It was just, it wasn't really black. It was sort of a mouse color. And you, it was dense, and it seemed like eternity, for it slowly came down like fog in a valley. And when it got to the floor, we had dead and wounded everywhere. What happened? We had, uh, I think it was 18 tons of bombs. It was, the Japanese had 27 planes, nine from three carriers, 27 planes with a 500 bomb in the center and three 250 on the wings. Flew in very tight formation and dumped all of those on our building. Their objective was to knock out the battleships knock out the B-17s that might come out and hit the convoy, and then knock out the personnel. So we were caught on the last wave on the personnel. Um, I spent the day in the barracks. It seemed like civilians from Honolulu came out and the roof was on fire, there was smoke bellowing down in the building, 
And I thought, if the roof's on fire, the whole damn building's going to burn. The civilians wanted to know what could they do. Well, I thought, we've got to save our blankets so we'll have something to sleep. So because of it, the civilians evacuated all of the sheets and the mattresses and dumped them out towards on the entrance. It turned out because of this concrete, they would have would not they would have, would not have burned. But I didn't know that, and uh, so I spent the whole day there in the building. I was told that our unit was rendezvousing. Hickam was on the channel, uh, and the water tower were down by the water tower on the channel of Pearl Harbor. We were rendezvousing our unit there, and I think there was supposed to have been some food being cooked somewhere, but I never did find it. But I went down there, and that was the first we knew of who had lived and who hadn't. We tried to sleep, but uh, there was planes coming in from the Enterprise, and there was a shout went up, the Japanese are landing. It came in with the lights on and we shot down some of our own people. Uh, uh, there were people jumping up at night, grabbing a gun. I don't know, every, every gun on the island was loaded. I don't know how many dogs might have gotten shot that night, but anything moving got shot if they were on the island of Oahu that night. Uh, I didn't sleep that night. I don't remember I had anything to eat that day, but that's my story of Pearl Harbor. Yes, um, I was in the barracks. I didn't see it, but uh, our flag was strafed, and there was a bomb blast at the bottom, and it was uh, riddled with holes. It was someone during the attack took it down and gave it to our uh, commanding general, and he personally took it back and gave it to General Arnold. It flew over the peace conference at Potsdam, where Truman, and, uh, and then it flew at the founding of the United Nations in San Francisco. It flew on the uh, Missouri at the signing of the peace treaty with MacArthur and Nimitz, and it now resides in the museum at Hickam Field. Um, it's getting very fragile, but is there, and you can see the the holes in it. And if you ever visit Hickam Field, go see it. Could you tell me again for the tape your highest rank and the exact name of your service? My service was from the 5th of August in 41, and I got out in 45, and I can't come up with that date, but I, I was separated from service from Langley Field, Virginia, where I was serving at the time. Uh, I just can't pin the date when I got out, when I got out, but I got my rank at that time was major, and I later was promoted to lieutenant colonel. Could you tell me, please, about the Arizona, about the ship? Um, I Heckam was adjacent to Pearl Harbor. And as Smart and I were 
going down, walking down during the attack, we could look over and we saw the black smoke billowing from ships. We of course did not know what ships they were and it burned for I don't know how many days afterwards. Uh, I, I, uh, we of course went over there and watched it from across, but we could, we could see it from where we were when we walked down. Uh, the Navy, uh, as we walked down, uh, I think I mentioned we saw the high-level bombers circling that were going, that they, well, they hit torpedoes, the battleships first, and then they dropped bombs with uh, uh, piercing bombs because the torpedoes could get the outside battleship, but they couldn't hit the inside, so they, they dropped uh, armor-piercing bombs to try to hit the battleships on the inside. Uh, we, there was four, let's see, two, 4,000, I believe, 4,003 lives lost. Uh, the Army lost roughly 1,000, and most of those were at Hickam Field. The battleship uh, lost something over a thousand, and then the Utah uh, lost uh, several hundred. Um, uh, we, there was a friend of mine. Uh, we were when when the they torpedoed the battleships they came over and strafed Hickam, so we were pretty well being strafed all the time uh, the people in the barracks again uh, the non coms of the Army Air Corps were mostly. Uh, World War One veterans that had served in the in the Europe and in the army. If you're under attack, the battle cry is to scatter so that you won't be as big a target. We had sergeants running through the barracks said, "Scatter! Get out! Get out!" Well, they were in the safest place they could be, so many did run out and ran out on the the parade ground, when they came to strafing, uh, they set most of the cars on fire. They were burning. But if you, uh, a friend of mine got under a wrecked car to try to get away from uh, strafing, it fell on him and he couldn't get out. Uh, Ann Bishop one of our five nurses at Hickam Field, who had 50-bed hospital, was late coming to work, and as she walked down, she saw Bishop uh, trapped under the car. She took her scissors and cut her petticoat and made a tourniquet on his leg. She took off her panties and stuffed it into a wound and saved his life. She, she went to her death, not getting into recognition, because she was, she was embarrassed. She didn't want the world to know that she'd taken off her panties. Um, they. Uh, you, I know people who have studied the attack are well aware that uh, Colonel Lang Langdon, 
He later became a three-star general and head of the Air Force, but he led uh, B-17s that were destined for the Philippines, and they they had been flying all night, and they came into nothing but black wall of flak of any aircraft. Um, so in the confusion of the Japanese Zeros, we had 17s coming in. Our 17s that we had were Cs, and they were not camouflaged, and a C doesn't have a tail gunner. The f planes that Langdon brought in were had tail guns, and they were camouflaged. So they looked altogether different, and we shot and killed some of our own airmen coming in after flying all night and then coming in to right in the midst of the battle. It is. Um, one of the 17s coming in, the anti-aircraft ground fire ignited the flares Planes before the war had flares with the thought if you had wounded aboard uh, and your communications were out, you could fly a flare and the operations could see it and give you leeway to come in to land ahead of everybody else. Well, this anti-aircraft fire hit the flare and started, and that's phosphorus and you can't put it out. They did land. It did kill one of our the flight surgeon aboard but it landed and the plane burned in two. Uh, um, I, I was with Brumwell when he was mortally wounded and I visited him in his hospital. He died on the 14th. Um, I, years later, maybe 10 years ago or 50 years after, I uh, wondered uh, about Brumwell. I'd been with him when he, when he was killed. Uh, of his family and all, and I called. Um, I knew he graduated from University of Kansas. I called the registrar at the University of Kansas, and I told him it was a peculiar request, but I had served with a gentleman, and he was a student, and I'd like to get in touch with his family. They gave me his hometown. It was Leeds, I think, North Dakota. I immediately ran over to the library and I got the book, Map of North Dakota, and I couldn't find it. And I went to the librarian and he took me to a bigger map and we found it. It was a little town right at the border of the Canadian uh, North Dakota border. I wrote a letter to the mayor of that town and I told him that I w wanted to get in touch with his kin folks. Well, I immediately, it wasn't maybe five days that I had a letter from his sister and she was in O'Neill, Nebraska and how elated she was. They had never heard oh, a word from anyone uh, uh, as to and how pleased they were. To uh, learn that someone was with him. Um,
she lived she lived in O'Neill, Nebraska, and she was visiting when the mayor came out. And how grateful they were that and I, uh, Melnick, was also with me, and he also wrote to them and related. Melnick was took him out to the car when they took him to the hospital, so they also was in touch with Melnick. Um, I don't know, there was 175,000 or so of us on the island at the time, and I don't know, we're down to very few, our numbers are pretty small today. At one time we were losing them a thousand a day, that's probably been accelerated. Uh, what did you do after Pearl Harbor, just briefly? After Pearl Harbor, uh, I became adjutant of the group. I no longer was in supply. And then I became adjutant of the base at, her, uh, at Pearl Harbor. And an adjutant is a very, uh, you're very well exposed and you wield some influence and power because you get all of the correspondence and you handle everything before the commanding officer gets it. I thought I was in a pretty safe spot. We furnished all of the cadres for all of the islands in the Central Pacific, Tarawa, Kwajalein, Saipan, all of the airfields, the people who manned the towers and the supplies, fuel and everything were cadres from Hickam Field, our unit. I felt pretty secure since I was in a position picking the people going out. But then our base commander, every colonel wants to be a general and he was no exception. And he was whining and dining and courting Nimitz and everybody. He wanted to be a general. And he found out uh, two years before that the island of Tinian was going to, the island commander would require a brigadier general. Saipan would be a uh, Army Colonel Tinian, because it was all airfield, would be an Air Force General, and Guam would be a Rear Admiral for the Island Command. So he worked his way around where he was head of the task force for Tinian, and he said, "I want you to be my adjutant." So Wambo, I'm going to Tinian, and I never heard of Tinian. I saw on the map. When he told me the code name was Iron, and so it was very secret. You're not nobody said what name it was. He just told me uh, Iron, and he showed me the, and it was shaped like a wing. If you've seen a a, a letter for trackman in college, it has a wing on it, and that island was shaped like that wing. I went home and I had a map of the Pacific in my home and I looked up and boy it just stood out that wing with Tinian Island so I knew where I was heading. Uh, uh, I got, well when I was adjutant all of the correspondence came across, and there was came across that we could sign two to go to an inspection school in Fort Logan, Colorado, in 1943. 
Well, I'd been over there since 41, and I thought, well, it's a chance I can get home. So I put in for one of the two to go to inspection school. I did. I came back, and Colonel Farnham made me base inspector. Then when he got head of the task force Tinian, I was made inspector general for the island of Tinian. Uh, and as a result, every unit that went to Tinian had to display all of their equipment, whether it was uh, artillery or trucks, whatever the unit was, had to display everything they had, all of their equipment out, and I, with two, air, two soldiers, had to walk and inspect everything. If there's anything that didn't look right, we just had to point at it, and they'd throw it out and get it replaced with new. So I had to look at everything that went to Tinian. As a result, the unit went on a ship, but I, with the two airmen, stayed back to inspect the units that came later. They went out and stood in, uh, on a ship at Kwajalein for some 30 days because we were, the Marines were held up in the Army taking Saipan, and there was a 30-day delay. So they, they just cooled their heels out at Kwajalein waiting to go in uh, to Tinian. With the two airmen and I, we flew out right after Christmas in 45. I know we crossed the international date line and we almost missed Christmas, but, but we, we ended up and ten in on Christmas. It was either the day after I think we arrived. And for Christmas, they'd been on powdered milk and uh, powdered eggs and powdered potatoes for all of the time. They had, we'd had no refrigeration. Well, I wasn't, they were not too friendly to me because I'd been sleeping under sheets and they'd been sleeping on the ground in tents and it was raining and this powdered food. So, but I, for Christmas, they flew in steak. I had my mess kit and uh, uh, got stood in line to get my steak. It was raining. So we stood there in the rain with the steak. And the damn steak was so tough I couldn't cut it with my knife, but we had it. We did chew on it. Um, five minutes. Uh, Tinian. Uh, again, I mentioned we stood in tape. We we watched movies on sandbags, and we'd get the latest movie. We, I think I saw Over the Rainbow. What's that girl's name? Judy Garland. Judy Garland. I watched Judy Garland, Over the Rainbow, found out the next day Japanese uh, were living in the sugar cane, and they were, they lived, they were watching our movie right next to us, and what they were not—they were trying to get food and clothes. They would, they would steal our clothes off the line at night, and they were not going to hurt anybody. They were just surviving. Uh, we had one. Uh, there was, I think, eight or nine thousand Japanese killed on the island of Tinian. And they were all pushed up in one big pile. And as being the inspector general, I had to, the colonel said, for guy's sake, you've got to enclose that and bulldoze in more because the international, the world would be against us if we, we had, the island Tinian was farmers and they had a lot of hogs and they had hogs running wild. And so we had to put the fence around this pile of, Japanese. I stayed at Tinian and came back in 45. I just lacked, oh, I think from March to August of spending the whole war 
in the Pacific. I did go, I went to New Caledonia, Canton, Kwajalein, Anahuitoc, uh, Saipan, Guam, Tinian. Is there anything you would like to add in our last two or three minutes about uh, your perspective on present times or words to the younger generation? Uh, At Pearl Harbor, the few survivors of the Arizona bivouacked a block and a half from the officers' club, and they'd come over in the evening and talk. There was one I remember. He was vivid. He he said he went to the University of South of Southern California. He took our naval ROTC which there were very few units at that time. Battleships before World War II was the thing to be in. He got assigned to the battleship, West Virginia, and he thought he had it made. But he said it started off, his wife would come to Hawaii, and the West Virginia would be in San Diego. She'd go to San Diego, and he'd be out in, in, in Honolulu. Uh, he said, I thought I had it made, but he said, I was, uh, I was, uh, uh, a victim of the war, and um, I can't come up with the word that he's, he said he was, but uh, he was, he was vivid about his destiny and what had been his lot. I was, um, my, my uh, group, uh, some say we were unfortunate. I'm inclined to think we're fortunate. We saw the world in World War II. We went through uh, the Depression. Uh, the economy and all picked up after the war. And I think I, I consider myself fortunate and very lucky. I'm honored to be asked. Thank you so much. We're honored you are here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gray. That was very heartwarming and excellent. Any, do you have any questions? I don't think so. I think you covered uh, everything that we needed. Um. All right. Anything you want here? No. Uh, 2,220 acres. It was the largest, newest airfield in the world at the time of December 7th. The entrance was up here, and you came down Signer Boulevard, which was a boulevard with hibiscus and uh, flowers, and we came to the Officers Club, which is down at the end at the entrance of Pearl Harbor. I, my quarters was a bachelor officer's quarters here. When the war started, the first building had, was the hangar here, and I could see it from my room. Smart and I got up and walked down, and the B-24 that was burning, and we, the skull was here, and we went down, down here, and uh, I was in the middle wing of the consolidated barracks here, and the hangar boulevard, is, hangars are along here, and the bomb crater that we saw, the water was in 
Hang, uh, Hang Boulevard here. It was a beautiful place. The tile, orange roof, uh, well mat landscaped and manicured. Uh, and this air, this strip here, every bomber that bombed in the Pacific at one time landed here, coming in from San, San Francisco to go on to Australia and the various other places. I enjoyed it, and I'm flattered to be asked.